Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I'm really glad uh, that you are continuing with us in our journey through our Bible investigation class. Uh, we took a couple of week break with spring break, which really gives our Sunday school teachers and those who watch the kids in the nursery an opportunity to recharge their batteries. If they want to go somewhere for a while, they have an opportunity to do that. And so, uh, so that's why we took a break for a couple of weeks. But this week, we're jumping back in. And uh, we are on the lesson uh, in regards to baptism. That's where we left off last time, and we made our way um, partially through that. Before we jump into that lesson, I just want to remind you uh, that if you are um, watching uh, from home or wherever, um, that on page 49 uh, of the workbook, there is what we call an adult information sheet, and then a page or two after that, we have some child information sheets. So if you're thinking about making St. Peter's your church home and you'd like to do that, it would be very helpful for us if you would fill out that adult information sheet uh, for however many adults in your family are participating, and then any children that you have still living at home, and then return those to us. So if you're back at the class next week, you can leave that on the table with the, uh, with the attendance sheets that we use, or you can drop those off at the church office. But if you'd be sure to get those to us, that would be uh, very helpful. So we are picking up um, this week uh, in, uh, in the material uh, on baptism, uh, and the question, uh, question number four, should adults who already know Jesus as Savior be baptized? So last time we talked about how baptism uh, in kind of fancy theological terms is one of two sacraments that we recognize in our church. Uh, baptism being one, Holy Communion being the other. We said a sacrament, according to our definition, is a sacred act that is commanded by God uh, that has a visible means in baptism, water, in the Lord's Supper, bread and wine, and in which God offers forgiveness of sins. And so we're going to talk, when we finish on baptism, we're going to start talking about the Lord's Supper. But we said that baptism is where God brings to us everything that Christ accomplished for us. So in baptism, God brings to us cleansing of our sin. The word baptize, we said, simply means to wash. So in baptism, God brings the, the cleansing or the washing away of our sin. In baptism, God wraps around us Christ's robes of righteousness. In baptism, God adopts us into his forgiven family, makes us his own. In baptism, God gives to us the gift of his Holy Spirit. So in baptism, you and I are simply the recipients of the goodness and the grace that God offers to us. And if you weren't with us um, the last time or didn't see the last session on baptism, I would encourage you to, to re-watch that because I think that'll help to fill in some gaps along the way. So should adults who already know Jesus as Savior be baptized? In Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 35 to 39, we have uh, a man from Ethiopia, uh, which is uh, one of the countries in Africa. And this uh, Ethiopian man has been reading the scriptures. He's been reading the Old Testament book of, of Isaiah. And there he reads about how someone was pierced for our iniquities and, and crushed for our sin. And, and he's asking Philip, who was a Jesus follower, Philip, help explain this to me. What's this all about? And Philip then begins to explain to this man about Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. And he talks to him about baptism. And so this, this man from Ethiopia says, well, shouldn't I be baptized? I want to receive this gift. And, and so we're told that Philip then baptizes this particular man. Um, so this was a man who, after Philip had explained who Jesus was, he, he trusted in Jesus as Savior. He knew Jesus to be his Savior now, but he still was baptized. Um, and in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, uh, Jesus says, Whoever believes and is baptized uh, will be saved, but whoever believeth not will be condemned. So should adults be baptized um, even though they know Jesus as Savior? Maybe you're watching this class and you have come to know Jesus to be your Savior and you've never been baptized. And maybe the question is, well, should you be baptized or not? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Um, the reality is this. Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Uh, and whoever believeth not will be condemned. So can one, um, uh, can one be in a right relationship with God apart from baptism? Um, yes, yes. Um, but should one who knows Jesus as Savior also be baptized? Yes. So we talked that normally we baptize infants. And then uh, God adopts them into his family. God makes them his own. God brings to them the cleansing blood of Jesus. God gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they then grow in their relationship with Christ. Um, an adult uh, 
who comes to know Jesus prior to baptism uh, should still uh, be baptized. Here's something that I've said, and I, and I think I can support it biblically. It's not, in baptism, as I said, God offers everything that Christ gives to us. It's not a lack of baptism that condemns, but it's a rejection of what God offers in baptism, because that's a rejection of Christ. So, uh, for example, can one be saved apart from baptism? Think about uh, the thief on the cross. Uh, Jesus was on the center cross. He had one man to his left and one man to his right. They were also being crucified. And these two men on either side of Jesus had been trash-talking Jesus and giving him a hard time. And, and finally, one comes to a census. He's been watching Jesus, and the Spirit of God has been at work in his heart, uh, evidently. And he turns and he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, this man knows that he also is about to die. And he knows that his eternity is hanging in the balance. And he knows that he's going to spend eternity in one of two places. And, and we'll unpack that in a couple of weeks, what happens after death. And so he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me uh, in your kingdom. And Jesus turns to that man and he says to him, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. That is, when you breathe your last, you're going to be with me in the presence of the Father. Now, this man had not been baptized, but he had faith because the Spirit of God had been working on his heart. He had faith that Jesus was, in fact, not only the Savior of the world, but his Savior as well. So, yes, it's possible to be saved apart uh, from baptism. If somebody is listening to this right now and they, they believe that Jesus has given his life for them uh, and they've not been baptized and maybe they have every intention to be baptized, but tonight their life is taken from them, uh, they're going to be with the Lord in heaven because uh, they, there is faith in Christ. Um, and so I, I don't want to give you the impression that one cannot uh, be in the presence of God apart from baptism, but if one comes to faith in Christ later, let's say, as an adult, um, should they be baptized? Absolutely. And so we offer that opportunity. So if you have not been baptized and you know Jesus to be your Savior, that I would encourage you to be baptized. And, and if I can help you with that, let me know. Let us know. We'd be happy to, to do that and make arrangements to make that happen. Um, and then uh, it says there, uh, water sponsors or godparents. So uh, in our church, we have the tradition of sponsors or godparents, and that's common in a lot of churches when they do baptisms. Typically, sponsors or godparents are more common when a child is baptized as opposed to an adult. But really, the notion of a sponsor for baptism or a godparent is kind of like a sponsor when it comes to, um, let's say, a recovery group, a 12-step program. If you're in NAA or NA or some other group like that, you are strongly encouraged to have a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody who's further down the road than you are. A sponsor is someone who's been there and done that. A sponsor is someone that when you're, you're tempted to drink or tempted to use or you're really struggling or having a difficult time, you pick up the phone and call your sponsor and say, I'm having a hard time. I need you. I need you to listen to me. I need you to, to walk me through this. And so a sponsor in a baptism is someone who then is to walk alongside that new believer in Christ and to encourage them in their faith, to model for them what it means to follow after Jesus. It's not required, uh, but that's what a sponsor is. So, for example, some people choose someone to be a sponsor uh, because, well, maybe they're a relative, they're a sibling, or they're a, a really good friend. Uh, but maybe that sibling or that really good friend doesn't know Christ, or they're not really in a relationship with Christ. And that's really not someone that we probably ought to choose to be a sponsor for our child. So I would encourage you that if you have a child uh, to be baptized and you're thinking about a sponsor, um, don't necessarily just go to your closest relative. Think about who do you know, and maybe it is a relative, who do you know who themselves is in a close personal relationship with Christ that not only takes their relationship with Christ seriously, but that you believe would take your child's relationship with Christ seriously. When we do a baptism, I ask the sponsors or the godparents, is it your intention uh, to pray for this child regularly? Um, is it your intention to seek to model for this child what it means to follow after Jesus? Is it your intention to, uh, to encourage this child in their relationship with Jesus? Is it your intention to encourage and support mom and dad as they seek to raise this child in the Christian faith? 
So my suggestion to you is, is as you're thinking about a sponsor for your child, think about someone you know who takes their own spiritual life seriously, who would also take your child's uh, spiritual life seriously as well. So um, again, if you've not been baptized, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to consider that, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, uh, there is a, a baptism form that you can fill out uh, on the next page uh, that if for you or for your child, uh, we do baptisms uh, within worship services. We also do them privately. So uh, if we do them in a worship service, we normally do those in our non-communion services, and primarily it's a matter of practicality and time. Um, and we can also do them in private settings. And so sometimes if somebody wants a private baptism, we'll do that after one of our worship services or at some other time. So be thinking about that. Let us know. Um, there are different ways that different um, groups of believers baptize. Some baptize. We typically, I just take uh, some water in my hand and put it on the person's head or forehead and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There are some who will take a, a, like a shell and they'll dip that in the water and pour that over the individual's head. There are some who immerse when they do baptism. They go to a, they have a, they go to a swimming pool or they go to a lake or they go to a river or in their church they have a baptistry where they can actually immerse. There are different ways to apply the water. And uh, there are some who say, well, you have to be immersed. Uh, biblically, I, I think we'd be hard-pressed on that. To me, it's not an argument uh, point. Um, some say, well, Jesus was immersed uh, because he came up and out of the river. But the only way to get out of a river is to come up and out. There's no other way. That doesn't mean he was immersed. Uh, the Jordan River, I think I shared with you, is about the size in our community, if you're familiar with our community, of Hall Creek. Uh, which isn't very big. It's not very deep. Now, sometimes uh, recently we had a significant rain and, and Hawk Creek was pretty deep. Uh, but sometimes it's kind of like knee deep or ankle deep. And that's the way the Jordan River is. So we don't know how deep the water was when Jesus was baptized. Uh, but um, so we apply the water in, in, in different ways. Um, I like what Luther once said. Luther once said that when you, when you uh, playing off the concept that the word baptize means to wash, when you wash your hands or when you wash your face or when you take a bath or when you take a shower, when you do that, he said, remember your baptism. Because as when you step out of the shower, your body is, is nice and clean. So every single day, God comes to us in the waters of our baptism. Every single day, our baptism is fresh and new. Every single day, God brings to us that cleansing of our sins, the assurance that we are his dearly loved children. He wraps around us his robe of righteousness every single day. So remember that. I think it's a beautiful reminder. I encourage people that uh, when they step out of the shower or out of the tub, take a little three-by-five note, a post-it note, and just put that post-it note on your mirror on the back of your bathroom door that says, remember your baptism. Every single day, if we take our shower in the morning as we walk out the door to head to work or to school or wherever, remember that you walk out that door fresh and clean, washed clean in the waters of your baptism. If you take your shower or your bath before you go to bed, then when you lay your head down on the pillow, remember that you uh, have been washed clean once again in the waters of your baptism, the cleansing blood of Jesus, and that God loves you and forgives you. Um, now, last time, somebody had a couple of notes, a couple of questions about baptism. And this one says, what happens to infants if they die before the opportunity to be baptized? Um, and then it says, uh, for example, one who dies in childbirth, uh, a child who dies in childbirth or st is stillborn, or um, uh, a miscarriage, or dies at SIDS with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, before being baptized? Do they go to hell since they uh, aren't considered spiritually alive? Um, and, and then another question with that, would it be uh, considered a sin of the parents if they didn't get the, bap the infant baptized if, uh, if they did happen to die before being baptized? Um, first of all, let me say this. While I believe that in baptism, God brings new life, God brings forgiveness, God brings the cleansing of sin, God wraps us up in his robes of righteousness, God adopts us into his family in the waters of baptism in the life even of a little child. The reality is that baptism is the only means that, that we have to bring Christ um, to a little child. That's the only means we have. We can't sit down with an in infant and uh, present the gospel like we're doing here today. Um, but in the waters of baptism, God reaches out even to those 
whose minds can't comprehend to bring to them his gifts in Christ. So baptism is the only way that we have to bring God's grace and mercy to a little child. But that doesn't mean that God, apart from baptism, can't offer his grace and mercy um, to, the, uh, to the unborn, to the child who dies as a miscarriage or who dies in childbirth or who dies of SIDS. Um, I, I can't pull out any Bible verse that says that the child uh, who dies in, uh, within the womb um, goes to heaven. I can't pull out any Bible verse that says that specifically. And yet, when I read in the context of all of Scripture, I read of a merciful God, a gracious God, a loving God, um, who desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so I believe that God can offer the grace and mercy and love that flows through the cross, even to that child who dies within the womb, or the child who dies of SIDS, just like he can in the waters of baptism. Now, I don't think that's an excuse to say, well, then put off baptism and don't deal with that, don't address that. Uh, my wife and I experienced the miscarriage a number of years ago, and I believe with all my heart that that child is with the Lord in heaven. I'm, I'm confident of that. I, I, I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that when we get to heaven, uh, we will know that child, and that child will know us. And we'll unpack why I say that in a few weeks when we talk about heaven. So, um, yes, I believe that that child can still be saved. Um, but again, I, I think that my encouragement to parents is have your child baptized as soon as you can. I think we had our kids baptized within a couple of weeks uh, after they were born. Um, some may wait longer. Uh, but um, I, I don't want to uh, frighten anybody in light of all of that. I think we should have our children baptized. But God can certainly act apart from that if he chooses um, to do that. And I can't quote chapter or verse for that either. But that's, that's my belief in regards to all of that. And then um, somebody says, uh, what do you think about the uh, Catholic priest in the news recently uh, who baptized saying, we baptize you instead of I baptize you? I, I don't know. I'm not real worried about that. Um, uh, in fact, the Bible doesn't even give the formula. The, bapt the, the Bible simply says to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say to say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, or we baptize you, just it says to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I don't really, uh, I'm not too concerned about that, uh, frankly. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts in light of that. I guess only one other uh, thing that I would um, comment on about baptism is that every now and then there are some folks who go through a Bible investigation class who maybe they were baptized as children, and maybe they have been apart from Christ and apart from the church for a long, long time. And now, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, um, that relationship seems to be reignited. And they say, I'd like to be baptized and just because I think it would be a meaningful thing for me to do. And we can do that as well. It's not necessary if you've already been baptized by a, a body of believers who believes in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that, that they are God. Um, that, that then it's not necessary because what God offered you in your baptism way back when is still good. But if you have a desire to do that, again, talk to me about that. We can make that happen. So, uh, baptism. I'd like now for us to go to the next unit uh, that talks about uh, the Lord's Supper. Remember, I mentioned to you that we believe um, that... Um, uh, based upon our definition of the sacrament, that both baptism and the Lord's Supper would be considered sacraments. Both are commanded by Christ. Um, both um, uh, offer a forgiveness of sins, and both um, have a visible means. So in the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body, and take and drink, this is my blood, for the forgiveness of all your sins. So let's, let's begin to talk about uh, the Lord's Supper, and uh, I'm not sure how far we'll get. I don't know that we'll get all the way through this lesson um, this week, but we'll uh, resume uh, next week if we don't get all the way through it. So the Lord's Supper, it says up at the top there, what is the background of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion? Uh, let me just say starting out that um, this thing that we call the Lord's Supper is known by a variety of names, uh, depending really upon your denominational tradition. So we'll oftentimes refer to it as the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we'll call it communion. Sometimes we'll call it Holy Communion. Some refer to it as the sacrament of the altar. Some call it the Eucharist. It's all the same thing. 
And there's no right or there's no wrong. It's not like it's wrong to call it the Eucharist or it's wrong to call it the sacrament of the altar. <clears throat> Whatever term you use for it, we're talking about the same thing. And the background of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion or the sacrament of the altar or the Eucharist takes us back um, to the time of Moses and the event that we know as the Passover. So <clears throat> in your Bible, if you want to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 12, you will see uh, some of the events leading up to all of that. So the book of Exodus, it's the second, second book in the Bible, uh, Genesis and then Exodus. We said that the word Exodus uh, means to exit <clears throat> or to go out. And what we find is that Moses now has been uh, tapped on the shoulder by God to lead the people of Israel, uh, the Jews, out of Egypt, where they've been now as a people for 400 years. Several generations have come and gone. So they've been there for 400 years. And when they started off in Egypt, remember they came down because there had been a famine and because food was available there. And they came down to get food. And because Joseph, the one in charge of the distribution of food, also a Jew, uh, had some clout with the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh said, hey, bring your family down here. We'll give them some choice land. They can live here and everybody will be in good shape. And that was the case for a couple of generations. But then after a while, uh, the Jews, the Israelites, began to multiply, uh, and there were more and more of them, and they became a threat to some of the Egyptians. And so what they did to try to uh, put their thumb on them, or to literally put their foot on their neck, was to make them slaves. So for some time, uh, the Jews or the Israelites were slaves then in Egypt, and they were not treated very well at all. And of course, the Pharaoh, who was very kind to them in the days of Joseph, had, was long gone. And his successors then got further and further away from this relationship with Joseph and his family. And now it's, it's anything but a good relationship. So God then uh, comes to a man named Moses and says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of slavery, out of Egypt, to a land that I have prepared uh, for them. So, so then God says, or Moses says, God, um, well, I, I'm going to need your help because I'm not, if I go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let the people go, he's going to laugh at me. So what God did was God began to exhibit his power and his strength in the, in the eyes of, Mo, uh, of Pharaoh to say, Pharaoh, let him go. So if you actually go back, uh, if we go back even a few chapters earlier, if we go back to um, uh, Exodus chapter um, 7, page 55 in the paperback Bible, Exodus chapter 7, what we find is that God begins to send these plagues. So um, 7 verse 14, bottom left-hand column there uh, on the left-hand side, uh, it says a, a plague of water turned to blood, where, where God caused the water of the Nile River to turn to blood. That's a pretty significant thing. Um, and then over in the next column, uh, the second plague, the plague of frogs, where God brought frogs out of the Nile, and frogs were everywhere, and then they began to die, and they stunk to high heaven. And, and then on the next page, page 56, the plague of gnats. There were gnats everywhere, uh, and they were breathing in the gnats, and it wasn't good. And then the plague of flies. So God was bringing all these plagues. And, and, and Pharaoh, just his heart got harder and harder and harder and said, I am not going to let your people go, Moses. So finally God said to Moses, Moses, the last plague will get his attention, and he will let you go. And so then God uh, said, what I'm going to do, Moses, is I'm going to send an angel of death, and the angel of death is going to come to every household in the land of Egypt, every household, and it is going to take the life of the firstborn of every household. And the only way uh, to escape that is for you, Moses, to tell all the Jewish families, all the Israelites, each family is to take a lamb, and it's to slaughter that lamb, and it's to take the blood of the lamb and paint that blood over the door frame of the house. And when the angel of death comes on the night that I'm going to send it, and it sees the blood over the door frame of the house, it will then pass over that house. That's where the term Passover comes from. It will then pass over that house and spare that house and spare the life of the firstborn. So Moses, I want you to tell all the people of Israel to do that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow through on that. And so sure enough, that happened. And then God sent the angel of death. And the angel of death came in every household where there was no blood painted over the door frame of the house. Um, the firstborn in that household was killed. And that was true even of the household of Pharaoh. The firstborn of Pharaoh uh, was killed. And finally, Pharaoh said, get out of here. I don't want to mess with your God anymore. 
So Moses led the people of Israel um, out of Egypt. They had to cross over the Red Sea. And as they uh, a- approached the Red Sea, um, Pharaoh changed his mind and began to send his army after them. And they were in chariots. And, uh, and there were so many that they could feel the, the Jews as they were approaching the Red Sea, could feel the ground shaking. And God said, Moses, uh, reach out your arms over the water and watch what I do. And so Moses did it. He'd seen God's work through all the plagues. And as Moses did that, we're told that God caused the waters of the Red Sea to separate. And it just opened up. And there was a wall of water on each side. And, uh, and the ground on the bottom of the sea dried up. It would normally be kind of muddy and mushy and hard to walk across. It dried up. And then the children of Israel walked across, all of them. And as they got across, the Egyptian army was in hot pursuit. And as the Egyptian army uh, was about to come across, also on dry ground, God caused those walls of water to come crashing down, uh, thereby destroying the entire Egyptian army. And, uh, and then the Israelites were free. And they ultimately made their way up to what we know as the promised land. And God told Moses, Moses, I want you to mark this day. I want you to mark this event, how I rescued you and delivered you from bondage and slavery. I want you to mark this day with an event known as Passover. And, and I want you to, um, to celebrate this every year with your people. And I want you to have certain food items so that you can teach your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and all the generations to come what took place when I rescued you from the Egyptians. And so you'll see there on that page, I've listed some of the the food items that they were to have uh, on this meal. And the way that it worked was that with each item that they would eat, uh, the, the youngest child who was able to ask the question would ask kind of the head of the house, grandpa maybe, and say, grandpa, for example, it says there, the more are. Uh, grandfather, why do we eat the more are? Why do we eat these bitter herbs dipped in salt water? Why do we do that? On all other nights, we don't do that. We don't, we don't dip bitter herbs into salt water. Why, why would we do that? Why are we doing this on this particular meal? And the grandfather would say, well, let me tell you this story. And he'd go back in the days of Moses, our ancestors lived in Egypt. And he would tell the story. And he said, because the Egyptian taskmasters were so harsh, our people shed tears and slavery was bitter. It was a difficult time. So we dipped these bitter herbs into the salt water to remind us of the tears that were shed by our forefathers and foremothers and the bitterness of slavery. And there were these different food items. I sometimes compare... Passover meal, kind of a combination between our 4th of July and our Thanksgiving meal. Uh, 4th of July, because 4th of July is a celebration of our independence, right? And and so I say 4th of July because this was the independence that God gave the nation of Israel from the Egyptians who had their feet on their neck as slaves. But Thanksgiving, because for us, at least at our house, there's kind of a set menu, so at our house, if you come to our house for Thanksgiving, uh, we're not going to have meatloaf. We're not going to have pork chops. Um, we're not going to have hamburgers. For Fourth of July, or for Thanksgiving, we're going to have turkey. And we're going to have mashed potatoes. That's what we have. Um, uh, we're not going to have french fries. We're going to have mashed potatoes. And then we're going to have dressing uh, with our turkey. And we're probably going to have noodles, maybe even homemade noodles. And for dessert, we may have some ice cream. We may have some chocolate cake. But I can guarantee you we're going to have pumpkin pie. There are just certain things that we have. It's that you can count on it every year. And God said there are certain items I want you to have in your Passover meal because I want you to teach a lesson to your children and your grandchildren that they can pass that on from generation to generation. So the first item was the morar, the bitter herbs dipped in salt water. A second thing that they would have was the Seth. It's listed for you there. Carol Seth was chopped apple, nuts, raisins, and cinnamon to recall the mortar used to make bricks in building the pyramids and the palaces. So when they were slaves, they built the pyramids in Egypt. And they built other things, palaces for the pharaohs. And so they would take this, they would have a, a chopped apples and nuts and raisins, and they would eat that. And, uh, and they would oftentimes put it on a, like a cracker. And the child would say, Grandfather, why is it? that on this night, we have the Seth, And then Grandpa would tell about how they built the pyramids and built the palaces for the Pharaoh. 
They also had the matzo, which is uh, unleavened bread. A uh, matzo is a uh, it was a staple for them. Um, unleavened meant it, it didn't have yeast in it to rise because God told Moses, Moses, you guys are going to have to get out of town really, really fast. You don't have time for the yeast to rise in the bread that you bake. So uh, matzah was a part of that. They would drink wine with the meal. They would have four different cups of wine on the table from which they would drink. Uh, this meal lasted a long time. And it wasn't to drink to get drunk. It was to drink um, to, to, again, learn lessons. And why would they drink uh, the wine? And, and, and when Jesus uh, instituted the Lord's Supper, when Jesus instituted this sacrament of the altar or Holy Communion with his disciples around the table in the upper room in Jerusalem, it was, they were celebrating the Passover feast. So Jesus instituted this sacrament of Holy Communion after or as he and his disciples were, were celebrating the Passover. And it was from the third cup of wine, we believe, when they would come to the third cup of wine, uh, which was called the cup of redemption, that Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and said, drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So they would drink from the cup of wine. And then the last element of the Passover meal, and there were some others, but I've just kind of mentioned the main ones, was lamb. Because remember, how did the angel of death know to pass over their house? Because if the blood of the lamb was painted over the door frame of the house, the angel of death would pass over. So a lamb was also prepared and eaten in the Passover meal. And of course, Grandpa would tell the story of the Passover lamb and the blood that was shed. But there are five characteristics of that Passover lamb that are, I have to point out because they all also point us to Jesus. See, I believe that the Passover was simply a kind of a children's lesson, a teaching point to point all of us, including the nation of Israel, ultimately to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. When, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to the Jordan River to be baptized as Jesus began his ministry, John, who knew who Jesus was, points everybody to Jesus. All these people have been listening to John. I mean, John, he's a rock star. They're listening to John. But John turns to Jesus and he says, Behold, which remember means pay attention. This is a big deal. Listen up. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when any good Jew, good Jew hears the term Lamb of God, they are immediately going to think Passover as well as Day of Atonement. And we talked about the Day of Atonement a few weeks ago um, when the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant and the curtain of the temple was torn in too. And God said, now you can come into my presence. So look at the characteristics of the Lamb. First of all, the Passover Lamb was to be without defect or blemish. Without de in other words, God said to his people when they were to take a lamb to slaughter, he said, I don't want you to take some three-legged lamb. I don't want you to take some scrawny lamb. I don't want you to take a deformed lamb. I want you to take the best you've got. And God offered us his very best in Jesus, who was without defect, without blemish. And I'm talking now about physical characteristics about Jesus, but he was without sin. He was without blemish. He was perfect. Though he was tempted in every way like we are, he never once gave in. Jesus was without defect or blemish. Secondly, all the blood of the lamb was to be drained. That was the instruction. All the blood was to be drained. And when Jesus hung on the cross, now yes, he had lost a lot of blood when they pierced him with the nails. A lot of blood. <coughs> He'd also lost blood when they pierced or crowned him with a crown of thorns. But then it says that just before he took his last breath, <coughs> or, or I should take that back, after he took his last breath, and they were checking to see if all the three guys were dead, um, it says that they, they pierced Jesus' side with a spear. He was already dead. And, and it pierced into where his heart was, and blood and water flowed out. All of his blood was drained. Thirdly, about the Passover lamb, not a bone of its body was to be broken. Now, when they came to check on the victims on the cross to see if they were dead, they had to hurry up and make sure that they were dead because they were about to, they were approaching the Sabbath. This was Friday when Jesus was crucified, and the Sabbath began, according to our calendar, Friday night at 6 p.m. So that really began their Sabbath day, their seventh day, their Saturday, would have begun our Friday at 6 p.m. 
And they had to get these victims off the cross. They had to get them off the cross before 6 p.m. So it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And they find that the victims alongside Jesus are still alive. So they break their legs. Because, I think as I described, or maybe George did, as you're hanging on the cross, you can inhale and inhale and inhale, but you couldn't exhale. And the only way to exhale then was to put your weight uh, on, instead of hanging, put your weight on your feet to, to, to exhale and then start all over again. So if they broke their legs, death would be sped up. When they came to Jesus, they realized he was already dead. And that's when they pierced his side with the spear. So not a bone of his body was broken. Fourth, um, the, the sacrificial lamb was to be roasted on a grill or a spit in the shape of a cross. So they would one way and then the other way. And, and the scriptures don't describe this, but we have historical documents that do. And of course, Jesus was crucified uh, on an instrument in the shape of a cross. And then lastly, um, it says that the sacrificial lamb was to be slaughtered on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was in that 24-hour period of our Thursday at 6 p.m. to our Friday at 6 p.m. And that's when Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was nailed to the cross about 9 o'clock in the morning and and taken off the cross about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So all five of these characteristics of the Lamb uh, coincide with Jesus. So it says there, Jesus, the Lamb of God. Remember I said that John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it says there, uh, first of all, uh, of Jesus, no defects. No defects. Um, 1 Corinthians 5 says that, or 2 Corinthians 5, Hebrews 4, though he was tempted in every way, he never once gave in. Jesus had no moral defects. He was without sin. No defects. And then uh, his blood was drained. All of his blood was drained. That's the reference I mentioned when they pierced his side with the spear. Also, from John 19, we see of Jesus, not a bone of his body was broken. They broke the legs of the criminals on either side of him, but not a bone of his body was broken. John 19, verse 17 says he was crucified on a cross. The same instrument, same shape of the instrument on which the, the Passover lamb was, was roasted. And then he was put to death on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this connection between Jesus and the sacrificial lamb tied to the Passover. And again, I believe that the entire Passover event was simply a, a lesson leading up to the ultimate sacrifice that would take place on behalf of all of us as Jesus' blood was shed that the angel of death might pass over us that we might spend eternity with the Lord in his presence. So, question number two. What is the benefit of this meal of the Lord's Supper? What's the benefit of that? Matthew 26 it is for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood, given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to assure us and to bring to us God's forgiveness that Christ won for us on a cross. The Lord's Supper is not just about taking an extra 15 minutes or 20 minutes in the service so that we can come down front and show off our Sunday best. Um, the Lord's Supper is all about God coming to us to bring to us the forgiveness of sins that God in Christ offers to us. It says there, the guarantee of forgiveness reminds us of God's unconditional love for us, which results in a sense of security. Um, so, for example, um, you say, well, well Christ, I, I know that my sins are forgiven. The Bible tells me that. But don't, if you think of a, somebody who's dear to you, don't you like to hear from them every now and then, I love you? I mean, every now and then, it's nice to hear from people whom we love, I love you. And every time that we have opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper, it's God saying to us, hey, I love you. I love you. You matter to me. In fact, I love you so much that I was willing to send my son to die for you. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. I assure you of that. Luther used to say, if, some, if the Lord's Supper is offered, and for some reason we see no need to go, he says, you ought to pinch yourself to see if you're still alive. Because if you're still alive, you still are in need of the forgiveness of God. And so every time we offer the Lord's Supper, at St. Peter's we offer the Lord's Supper every week. Not every service, but every week. 
So in our more traditional services, uh, we offer the Lord's Supper the first and third uh, weekend of every month. In our more traditional or contemporary services, we offer the Lord's Supper the second and fourth weekend of every month. And when we have a fifth Sunday, we offer that at all services. So um, I would encourage you to come, that whenever we have the Lord's Supper, to come. Now some say, well, if you go too frequently, you can kind of take it for granted and not really think about it. And we should be careful about that. So... How do we properly prepare to receive the Lord's Supper? Turn to the next page, question number three. How do we prepare to receive this meal? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, it says we ought to examine ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We should examine ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So how do we examine ourselves? Um, In other words, we shouldn't just thoughtlessly go up to the Lord's table. We should think about this and and recognize what we're here receiving. I have four questions there for you that I think are helpful for self-examination. We encourage our people to ask themselves these questions. First of all, do I believe that I'm a sinner? And am I sorry for my sins? Because the Lord's Supper is for the forgiveness of sins. So if I don't recognize my sin, if I don't recognize my need for forgiveness, why should I even go? So that's why we always have a time of confession prior to the Lord's Supper. It might be right before the Lord's Supper. It might be earlier in the service. But we always have a time of confession prior to the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper is for the forgiveness of sins. Secondly, do I believe that God, for Jesus' sake, forgives my sins? Forgiveness of sins doesn't come because we showed up for church that day. Forgiveness of sins doesn't come just because we're sorry for our sins. Forgiveness of sins comes through the cross. Forgiveness of sins comes from the shed blood of Jesus upon a cross. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Thirdly, do I believe that the body and blood of Jesus are present with the bread and the wine? Now, Paul says that we can take the Lord's Supper for our, our harm as well as our good. And he says, you know, if we take uh, the, bo- the, the, the Lord's Supper without recognizing the body of Christ or the blood of Christ, we can take it for our harm. So, so do we believe that somehow, mysteriously, supernaturally, the very body and blood of Christ are present? Now, I don't know how. Some say, well, it, it, the, the bread symbolizes the body of Christ. The wine symbolizes the blood of Christ. Um, and, and I would say I would have a hard time arguing that if it weren't for other passages of Scripture that speak about that. If you go down to the next section, for what elements are present in this meal, in Matthew 26, Jesus says, this is my body, and this is my blood. And you say, well, that's, that's not enough proof. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, is not the bread that we break a participation or a oneness in the body of Christ? Is not the the cup that we drink, is it not a oneness or a participation of the blood of Christ? And some say, well, it asks the question. It doesn't answer the question. No, it does answer the question. Because when it says, is this not, the word there always brings forth a yes answer. Always. Um, It's kind of like we can do that with, with inflection or tone of voice. I grew up in Illinois. I grew up in Illinois. I graduated from high school in 1975. In those days, those were the Lou Henson days at the University of Illinois coaching basketball when Bob Knight was at Indiana University coaching basketball. And when I moved to Indiana, I had to be honest with people and say, listen, and when you grow up in Illinois, and when Lou Henson was at Illinois and Bob Knight was at Indiana, you really couldn't be an Indiana fan or a Bob Knight fan. I'm not saying Bob Knight wasn't a basketball genius. He, he knew his basketball. But the fact is that I might, have, I might say, uh, you like Bob Knight? You like Bobby Knight? Now, to say it that way implies like surely not, right? Or you could ask it the other way. That would imply, sure, isn't he a great guy? So the word used here implies yes. When we receive the bread, it is also a oneness of the body of Christ. Yes, when we receive the wine. So... Yes. And then in 1 Corinthians 11 and 20, uh, verse 27, he talks about those who take the body and the blood of the Lord without understanding, without knowing. So the third question there, do I believe that the body and blood of Jesus are present with the bread and the wine? I don't understand how it's present. I just believe what Jesus says, and I believe what the scriptures teach. So I don't try to somehow rationalize scripture by saying, well, that's not really what it meant. I'm, I, it's what it says. It's what it says in more than one place. So somehow, supernatural, I know that when I receive the bread, uh, I'm not eating human flesh in the sense of if I 
take a bite out of my hand. I, I know that if I put the wine of the Lord's Supper under a microscope, that, human, that, that, that traits of human blood won't show up. But Jesus said somehow, I mean, Luther said in or with or under, somehow in or with or under, somehow the body of Christ is present with this very bread. And somehow the blood of Christ is present in or with or under um, this wine. So do I believe that the body and blood of Christ are present? And then fourthly, do I desire to turn from my sins and live for Jesus? Do I believe that I, that I want to turn from my sins and live for Jesus? In other words, it doesn't mean do I have my life all together. It doesn't mean that when I walk away from the Lord's table that I'm going to be perfect and sinless. No, what it means is, is it my desire having been on the receiving end of God's goodness and grace and mercy, is it my desire to seek to honor him? That if there are areas in my life where I'm out of bounds, where I'm stepping over the line, where I know I'm not where God wants me to be, is it my desire by the power of the Spirit to come back in line with where God wants me to be? Do I desire to turn from him? So we invite um, anyone who can examine themselves, those who say, you know what, I recognize my sin, I'm sorry for my sin. Yes, I, I look to Jesus to offer me cleansing for my sin. Yes, I believe, I don't fully understand, but I believe that the very body and blood of Jesus um, are, are present in this sacrament, and yes, I want to live for him. And so anyone who's welcome, uh, anyone who can answer yes to those questions is welcome to come uh, in our church to the Lord's table. That's not necessarily the position of all churches. It's not the position of all the churches in our denomination. But the Bible says, let a person examine himself. It doesn't say that the pastor has to make sure that you, it doesn't say that, that you have to have a, a card that says you're a member of this particular denomination. It says, let a person examine himself. And if that's where you're at, then you are welcome in our church to commune. For children, we ask that they go through a, a, an instruction program so that they know what the Lord's Supper is all about. And we began that in the fifth grade for children here at St. Peter's. So if you have a fifth grader, a sixth grader, a seventh grader, they're welcome to come um, for that. So um, what elements are present? We talked about that under question number four. We believe that when we receive the Lord's Supper, that we receive not only bread and wine, but also the very body and blood of Christ. And I've just listed for you there some different understandings of the Lord's Supper by different groups of Christians. It's not worth fighting over, um, but we believe what we call the real presence. We believe that the body of Jesus are really present and the bl blood is really present in and with and under the bread and the wine. Some believe in what's called a symbolic presence. They believe that the bread and wine or the bread and juice simply symbolize or represent the body and blood of Christ, but that's really not what Jesus says. And then some believe in what's called transubstantiation. Trans means across, like transatlantic means to go across the Atlantic. So transubstantiation means that they believe that the, that, the, that the bread is changed into the body of Christ, that the wine is changed into the blood of Christ. So just some different understandings. And then lastly, question number five, with this assurance that God has forgiven me, uh, what impact does this have on my relationship with others? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. In other words, let's put some uh, teeth in, in, in this sacrament. It's not just a matter of you and me going forward to receive bread and wine and the assurance that our sins are forgiven. Yes, it is that, but having received that forgiveness, then what does God desire of us? And he desires that we would then forgive one another as he's forgiven us. And that's what Ephesians 4, 32 says. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And then Matthew 18 I'm going to close with that. In Matthew 18, uh, we find uh, Jesus being approached by someone. It was Peter. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive somebody when they keep on wronging me? How many times? And in, in Peter's day, many of the teachers said you had to forgive somebody three times. If they, forgive you, if, they, if they wronged you once, you had to forgive them. Second time, you had to forgive them. Third time, you had to forgive them. But if they wronged you a fourth time, you could let them have it. And, and so Peter says, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Uh, how about seven times? And we should probably give Peter some credit because he really doubled what many were teaching and he added one on for good measure. And Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And what Jesus was saying to Peter was, Peter, listen, you just keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving, just like I keep on forgiving you and will continue to keep on forgiving you. And the 70 times 7 also says, and no matter how big the sin is, no matter how huge the sin is, no matter how offensive it is, Peter, I want you to forgive. Because no matter how big your sins are, I'm just going to keep on forgiving. And then Jesus told the story about a man who, uh, uh, who had wronged uh, somebody. 
and who had a huge, huge debt of, uh, of uh, a sin piled up against him. And, um, and, and how uh, he then he was called to forgive that person. Now, I'm going to uh, pick up there next time, okay? So I'm going to pick up at that point next time to unpack that, and then we'll jump in uh, to the next lesson to follow, okay? So we'll just kind of leave that hanging. Some of you know that story. But, but having received God's grace and forgiveness in and with and under these elements of the Lord's Supper, uh, God says, listen, and having received his grace and mercy every single day in the waters of our baptism, God says, I want you to forgive others just like I've forgiven you. So we'll pick up there next time. Let me close with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for how you come to us uh, in the waters of our baptism daily and how you come to us or give us the gift of your Son wrapped up in bread and wine to assure us that you have washed away all of our sin and to empower us to release that forgiveness to others. God, may that be true of us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So thanks for uh, watching. And uh, join us next time.